Well, we're grateful to have everyone in this class, our latest Bible class, and hope that the things that we'll say will be helpful. Before we get started, I want to go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Holy Father, we're thankful for the day that has given us. May we never cease to be thankful and count our many blessings. We're thankful for life in which we serve thee that we might prepare ourselves for eternity. We're thankful for these who come together to study thy word. And we pray we'll make sure we do that daily and regularly. We pray thy guidance on the congregation of spring that each one of us will live righteous before thee. Even with those who are ill in various ways. Help us be ready to help them and be ready unto every good work. Guide us on through the study of Ecclesiastes, that we will know what true wisdom is and apply it to our lives. For we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. After going through the introduction part, which was now two months ago, and last month going through what we did, I decided that if I didn't do something different, um, we might be here at the turn of the next millennium. <laughs> so I've changed things around as to what I'm going to do. And of course, as always in class, it depends upon the students reading every word of words or the text, because I intend to try to basically summarize. And I will be giving the verses that are there, but rather than read them. Now, if you read it at home, please make notes. Ask any questions, put them down, and we can deal with them in some way or the other. Um, but I think if we just take it verse by verse, like we started last week or the last month, I think we'll be involved in this a very long time. And we won't even remember what we studied the first part of it, time to get to the end of it. The big thing that I want to emphasize about the whole book is that it is seeking the purpose of life in the flesh on this earth, as he says, under the sun. That is a reoccurring idea through this. It brings it also very much up to date because that's what everybody would like to know. What is my purpose here on this earth? And then the next thing is how to have the good life. We're trying to look at ethics on Sunday morning and have been for a good while. Well, uh, ethics and morals involves itself in what is the good life. And of course, really, you have that being dealt with in Ecclesiastes, but he does it from a different way than what we normally would. We want to, we want to remember that he said that in his considering everything under the sun, that to consider his estimation of mirth or pleasure or wine and wisdom, folly and wealth as that which is the purpose of living. A lot of people live lives like that. He drink and be married for more we die because they do not look beyond this life. And I think you'll see that the Ecclesiastes, therefore, is to use a much overworked word in the last 50 some odd years, relevant, very up to date for us today. I think you might be surprised just to walk up to the average person on the street, the way things are now in America, and say, well, What do you think the purpose of life is? Be interesting to see what you would hear. So, to appreciate his conclusion for what is best in life, and to make uh, one uh, make the one who makes it uh, possible for each one of us, the book then is laid out. It's just that he teaches like they would have taught in those days, and that kind of teaching is not necessarily done as it been for years. I pause here and say that. If you look at the teaching that was done by Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, just like as they write the letters, say the letter of the Romans or the Galatians, we don't begin letters like that. We don't write letters like that. So things have changed, but the emphasis that is given has not changed. And the way the Hebrews did it, 
varied somewhat from what the Greeks did. Uh, anybody know what the Socratic method, method of teaching is? Socratic method. But well, Socrates, though there's such a great wise teacher, was the one that taught by asking questions. He would ask questions in such a way as to pull out the answer and get people to think. So you see Jesus uh, doing that in once in a while. Well, looking on into Ecclesiastes, I'm going to start with chapter two rather than repeat the introduction. And uh, we were into about into this the last time together anyway. And in this particular chapter, and we have it, remember it wasn't written in chapters and verses, but as uh, it is now given in this chapter, chapter two, uh, we'll refer the writer as the preacher, because that's what it says in the Hebrew, go ahead, uh, is the preacher. He is in this particular chapter describing the extent, to what degree that he sought the meaning of life under the sun. This brings up what I said a moment ago. He considered the matter of birth and pleasure. And what did he conclude? That it's vanity. What does vanity mean? It's pointless. It doesn't give you anything long abiding. So uh, he experiments with wine, which stands for all kinds of drink, and what he calls folly. What we don't use that word folly anymore. Does anybody tell me what folly means? Well, not necessarily. It can be fun, but it's fruitless effort. It's folly. You'll remember that it was Secretary Seward who purchased Alaska. Well, because of where Alaska is and so forth, they call it Seward's folly. And the people, the aristocrats in uh, the United Kingdom, particularly in the 19th century, would build what they call follies. It would be just an elaborate uh, playhouse, <laughs> sort of the mountain yeah. too. And sometimes they would call them a, a temple of the winds, or they would give them a name, but they would just be over here. And we might call it gazebo today. Except those was made out of granite and marble and everything else. It was just for decoration, what might be be the house. Well, folly. So he said he saw purpose in folly. And uh, he did this while being guided by wisdom. Now let's not lose sight of the fact God gave him wisdom. But that doesn't mean that he always did the right thing. We know better than that because of the way Solomon sinned. Yet God said, because you gave, you asked for wisdom and did ask for riches and all these kind of things, then I'm going to give you all those too. So he certainly enjoyed himself while not withholding anything from himself. And you see this, this is the first, the first 10 verses Oh, chapter 2, he's dealing with that very point. He used that great wealth to build and to accumulate everything that came across his mind that he wanted. Of course, what he had in those days wouldn't compare to what we have today. But whatever was the best there was in those days that anybody could get, he had it. And that's the point being made. Well, how do you make a modern day application? Same thing. You could amass all that a person, well, you might say it this way, all that money could buy. And according to Solomon, it's still um, vexation. It, there's no point to it. Now, now think about how this nation needs to know that. So when the preacher looks back on all that he had done, what does he conclude? Vanity. It's vanity and it's uh, grasping at the wind. That's how he does it. So he reflects upon the comparative value of wisdom and folly. 
And what does he say? Oh, you have all this wisdom that other people don't have. Here's this other person that plays a fool and just after everything that glitters, so to speak. Um, how does one excel the other? Well, it doesn't when when you die. The fool dies and the rich wise man dies. What's the difference in there as far as this life is concerned? Well, there's not any. Now, it's true that he valued wisdom over folly just for what it does as far as this life is concerned. But again, you got to remember he's talking about our conduct under the sun, on this earth, in the flesh, governed by time and space. So he observes that death came to both the wise and the fool. And then he says something, it's interesting, and both of them are soon forgotten. Uh, families may remember their mothers and fathers and aunts and uncles and cousins or, or even grandparents. But as far as everything is concerned, even if you're in a family tree, they become just names that lived 200 years ago or 300 or 100 years ago. So people don't take no them uh, in, in that sense. Even the people who, <laughs> who do such great things, great generals, people, unless sometimes they do special studies because that's what they do in the study of history, they don't, they don't know who they are. Uh, names that were readily recognized among the generals in World War II among the American people. Some people wouldn't know who they were. If I were to mention General Joseph Stilwell, or if he was no Vinegar Joe because he was such a raspy character, most well, people who that is, they've heard of him. But he was the head of the American forces in Burma, that area. Well, no, you can't read that history. Uh, I doubt some people even know who Douglas MacArthur was. I like to think we do, but uh, you know who Patton was, and so. But all of those, uh, if I say B. Dale Smith, do you know who you are? <laughs> well, he was with Ike every step of the way, and Patton hated him because he was Ike's lieutenant right up with him. He was a General too, but see, you would have known all of that readily if you'd lived through World War II and read it. How, how soon we forget, or maybe we never knew. And you can go on and on. Uh, people are always surprised when they do the family tree. The mother wish they hadn't. <laughs> but but <laughs> they find a lot of rotten limbs. <laughs> well, that's just the way it is. In other words, I'm elaborating on this. But that's what he, he's concluded. Inspiration is recorded. This is says, now think about this. Let's lesson to be learned here. And even if you accumulate a great wealth, what does it really do for you? Anybody ever heard of David Rockefeller? And I know you heard of Rockefeller. Well, David was one of the um, five sons um, and a great banker and again, but he was one of the five sons of John Rockefeller the second junior. The old man Rockefeller only had one son, but then he had five. And uh, he uh, had all that money. And I think he had, I've forgotten now, I could have I could have told you some point. It seems to me he had several different transplants of heart and so forth. He was 40. When one quit or got bad, he had another one. He's been dead now just a few years, but he lived up in the 90s. I promise you he wouldn't have lived that long. If you haven't been able to have these transplants, then money bought it for him. Well, you don't know who he is, and yet he was one of the biggest movers and shakers in the whole banking industry in various ways. Anybody ever heard of Winthrop Rockefeller? He's another one of the brothers. He was the governor of Arkansas. <laughs> he was the one that broke the the strain of all Democrats 
uh, rules were elected. You know, at one time you didn't have anybody elected in the South as a Democrat, so, that kind of thing. When he moved to Arkansas, he was sort of the black sheep of the family. I said, people don't know those things. Yeah. So that's the point made here. So even accumulated wealth uh, gives you a little respite. Um, but the point made here, no matter what you got, little or great, you leave it all. Leave it all behind. And so the most wealthy, what are they going to take with them? Nothing. Yeah. Thus, well, they get to take their clothes. <laughs> the preacher found such efforts to be grievous, and it caused him sorrowful days and restless nights. Now, if you look for a little eleven, he elaborates on all of that at eleven all the way through the end. Uh, well, through verse twenty-three anyway. For what if man of all his labor and of the vexation of his heart, wherein he had labored under the sun? And notice that verse 11 says, Then I looked on all the works that, that my hands had wrought, and on the labor that I had labored to do, and behold, all was vanity and vexatious spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. Um, he had everything he ever wanted as far as <clears throat> food is concerned, as far as drink is concerned. And he did conclude that not the best you can do is enjoy what God's allowed you to have. That's about it on this earth. But notice there's never this vision at this point of eternity where you will be. And this is just a, a snap of the finger or a blink of the eye as far as our time here. Or as James said, life is like a vapor that appears for a little while and vanishes away. So he did realize that he had the ability to enjoy what he had here. And so that's one thing he does um, is say that you ought to enjoy whatever your hands uh, put out. And, and I may say that is true. Uh, when you look to Abraham, Abraham in his day would have been a multi-millionaire. Remember how the flocks and the herds got so great that Lot, who had his own, his nephew, had his own flocks and herds, they couldn't, the land wouldn't hold them. And in those days, among those nomadic people, that's how you judge uh, the worth of a person, the wealth of a person. And you remember when he went to rescue Lot, that he uh, armed the servants in his own hired house. He came to how many was it? Well, over 200 people. It was more like a tribe of Abraham as the head of it. And they considered not only the flesh and blood relations, but also all the slaves and the concubines and all the servants, they were all his. And they were loyal enough to him that when he put a sword and a shield, if you please, in their hand, they did what he's told and went after Lot. So the point being made, God has never had a problem with people enjoying the fruit of their labors. But when you get to the New Testament, he tells us plainly the same thing. But he warns us and warns us, even as here, not to let those things dominate us, be the chief interest in our life. And in James, he addresses, remember, it's written to Christians, so he's not writing to people who weren't Christians. And he talks about the rich people, how they treat the poor people, and so forth. And that's not the way it is. God expects folks, whether you have little, or much to use whatever you have to help the person who can't help himself. That is the benevolent disposition of the godly person. We're not talking about people who won't try to help themselves. That's obvious. A man won't work, what? Neither should he eat. And if we follow that strictly and consistently throughout the nation, it would change all sorts of things. So it's obvious then that. He says that we're to work, and there's a reason that we work. When you get the New Testament, you have that brought out very much. Even makes it clear that the parents ought to lay up for the children. There's something to hand down to them, this kind of thing. And yet, in doing so, you see first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. No, these things shall be added to you. It's a matter of priorities. Now, what is he saying here? Well, his priority was what? 
to find purpose and meaning to life by looking into all the material things. So he, in the process, he says, yes, I, I do have the right to, to enjoy what I earn, but it shouldn't dominate you, shouldn't um, overcome you. You look at people who care not for God today, who wouldn't even give thought to things as the preacher here did in Ecclesiastes. And they're always talking about accumulating this, accumulating that, winning the lottery. Look at, look at how many people. If they would take that money that they spend on the lottery and save it all the way up to the retirement years, there's no tell what kind of money they have. But they spend it, spend it. Think of the people who are addicted to cigarettes. I don't know what the cost of a carton of cigarettes are now. Anybody know? Way seven up. There. Eight dollars a carton. Eight more More than that, isn't it? Oh yeah, it'd be eight dollars a pack. I'm thinking. I know for I'm my to... I know for my mom's pack, <laughs> and she made me have to get it for her to like ship it to Jamaica. It was like seven fifty two. My mom, my mom would be smoking. They were only 25 cents. <laughs> <laughs> but at that damn time, look how much money they were still expensive. Oh, yeah. The point I'm making is people who seek, as he's talking about here, happiness and purpose for life in things waste money. They're not frugal. They don't plan. They spend it on everything under the sun. And yet, to be balanced, as he's talking here, God does allow us to enjoy what we get. Never when the angels came and Abraham saw them in the, old, in the plains of Mamre, uh, you know, go out here and kill them, kid or whatever he said, a little cat. And well, I can't even do that. Can you go out? If you have a company over, do you kill a cat? Think how much that involved. But so all this kind of thing, it, it, it's really talking about moderation. So God gave the ability for people who are not at all in service to him faithfully to gather and collect great wealth. Look at it all around you. Very wicked people have great wealth. But eventually, when all said and done, it winds up in the hands of somebody else. And think about now what we have in the rich farmer who has such a bountiful crop. What am I going to do? My barn going to hold what I've got. I have bigger barns and all of that. And what God called him. Oh, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall all these things be? So whatever we possess, whether it's this shirt or tire, tie tack or shoes or watch or house we're in, it's going to be somebody else's. They're going to live there, and uh, they're going to enjoy it. They don't tear it down, <laughs> but it'll be there someday, not yours. Everything we've got, we're just passing through. So thus, much labor without God's blessings is what? It's bad. And it's a grasping of the wind. And that's what he emphasizes in verses 24 through 26. For all the days of sorrows and surreal grief, yea, his heart taketh not rest in the night. This is also vanity. And as you look at the verse 26, for God giveth to a man that is good in his sight, wisdom, and to knowledge and joy, but to the sinner he giveth travail to gather and to heap up that he may give to him that is good before God. This also is vanity and vexation of spirit. Now, if you use wealth wisely, then you're going to be giving God. Do you know, notice how much in the New Testament, how much emphasis is given to giving of your means as you prosper cheerfully without grudging to the Lord. Uh, sometimes we, we're, we have, I think, failed to get the message, um, or it doesn't get emphasized anyway that's found in Paul's writing in 2 Corinthians. Now, we know 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2 makes it clear that there is a contribution in the assembly of the saints on the first day of the week that is a part of our worship. 
and we plan beforehand according to that we've been prosperous what we're going to give but if you really want to see where giving comes from and it parallels so much from the book of Ecclesiastes you look in chapter 8 of 2nd Corinthians and you got to remember what he wrote to them in 1st Corinthians and then he writes a second letter and he tells us a lot that, that the writer of Ecclesiastes does. Now, Paul selects the Macedonian Christians as to what they gave as the example to the Corinthians. Why is that important? Because the Macedonian Christians were very poor. They, Macedonia, had undergone a terrible war, and all kinds of earthquakes. They were in such bad shape that Rome even excluded them, exempted them from paying taxes. Now, anytime Rome would do that, that tells you what a mess it is. But Paul uses them as an example of the Corinthian brethren. But the Corinthian brethren are very wealthy. Why does he use them? Well, you'll notice verse 3. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing on themselves. There's a whole thing. Likely they didn't give anything in this collection, like Corinthians, as far as the amount is concerned. But they gave more than Paul even expected them to be able to give. And he says, How could they do that? Because they had given them credit. Well, what is he saying in Ecclesiastes? He's seeking the meaning of life on earth under the sun. He's seeking the purpose for life. He's ruling out things that we've seen here in, in this. And so to really get the proper view of things, what is it? Well, it's wealth, news, however you get it, however much or little it is, in service to God. So I'm going to turn away from that right now. But um, that's what he was saying in the last, um, the last verse is there that where we were for God give to a man that is good in the sight of wisdom and knowledge and joy but to the sinner he gives travail to gather and to heap up and notice that he may give to him that is good before God this also is found in the vexation of spirit uh, that, that is actually saying that he's talking about that winds up where well, let me ask you this where did the money come from in your paycheck if you got one even if you get social security whatever where, where did that money come from when it comes from god i know everything we get ultimately from god is good but i'm talking about it's whoever hires you that pays you. So you don't know where all that money is being or what it's yeah. done. Give you an example. You have a bank account, you have a savings account, little or a lot. What does the bank do with your money? Uses it. <laughs> Investments. Or you think a bank <laughs> would take some of your money and loan it to a fellow who wants sure. to start a liquor store? Sure. Hmm. Of course they do. That they and, and they loan that money, they make money on it. That's called usury in the scriptures. We call it interest. So the point is the money is um money is only as good as the person who gets it and uses it. <laughs> That's what it comes down to. And when it comes to bad people, that doesn't um not the way it works too well. You ever wondered why the mafia gives so much money to Catholic Church when everything they do is about as wicked as it gets? I mentioned this the other day, I think. They're trying to find a way out into heaven. Well, they have a religion that allows that, mm -hmm. that permits it. They think that, you know, all these murders and cheating and killing and whatever else we've done. Um, we're going to hedge our bets. <laughs> that's what it amounts to. Well, that's the way people think if you don't watch out. Is that the way that the writer of Ecclesiastes is thinking? Well, let's hold judgment on that because 
we're getting out of this from the word inspiration gave us. Therefore, it's good for us. It has to be something that is good for me. And one of the things I've learned already is before we ever get into chapter three, in view of the fact that the whole purpose of the book is say, what is the book of life? Where do you find it? What's the good life? Well, we've seen several things. He says, ah, it's not good. And he says, I'm the wise man, and I was as wealthy as anybody could be possibly. I held back nothing. I saw, I saw peace and contentment and happiness every way I wanted to. And it was all under the matter of uh, material things. And he keeps saying, what? It's vanity. Vanity of vanity. Well, when you come into chapter three, to everything is the season and the time to every purpose under the sun. Well, of course, if anybody knows the thing about Ecclesiastes, they probably know that one. It's one of the songs that incorporated all that into it. So here we're reflecting upon the preacher and his observation. We're looking at them, we're thinking about them. As he gleaned them, as he picked them, you might see somebody picking beans out of the garden or something like that. Well, just think of that as somebody getting all this stuff that he looked into, trying to find the purpose of life. And we're looking at it now. Does it really give us what the real purpose for man in the flesh and the son is? Uh, so, we want to understand why God's ways are sometimes inexplicable. Have you ever wondered why God does what he does? Uh, have you ever pondered it? We know Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, the secret things belong to God, but the things that are revealed belong to us, my children. Have you ever wondered about the secret? There are some things, remember what, for those of you that were in the Godhead class several months ago, one of the things we emphasized is we probably couldn't grasp with our finite human minds now uh, the thing, all that God does. Uh, explain how something can exist without beginning and never began and never will end. I can't grasp that. I can accept the fact that it's there, but I can't understand how it happens. I mean, how it can be. Uh, why did God choose this way? Why did he make man like he did and put him here? Uh, since he's omniscient, that is, he knows all the object of knowledge, he knew man from sin. Yet man of free will chose to sin, he didn't make him sin. And so he had this whole plan to save man. But if we don't watch out, we think, well, that plan begins and ends with this world. And when it's over with, do you ever wonder, what then? Have you ever tried to think of yourself in that glorified body like Christ now has in heaven? What are you doing? What do you do in that eternal day? So you can't fathom it. We're going to sing. <laughs> God saves. What, what I'm going to give you an assignment right here. I've never mentioned this before. Notice how many songs we have in the songbook that have angels singing. I want you to find me one place in the scriptures that mentions angels singing. <laughs> Try it. Trying to find one place in the, in the, in the Bible. They sang one of Jesus was born? They did. They well, did. They did. They sang that with the same Hosannas. Read the text. <laughs> <laughs> you, you've been it's just like people saying well there were three wise men were there? I don't know about how many there was but there was some yeah but most people see three gifts yeah, yeah, and they think three true. wise men almost uh, my first place to ever preach one old fellow been in the church for a hundred years now all of a sudden he said he thought oh, there were three wise men like one of the old ladies he spoke up past said uh, said Uncle Jesse then it doesn't say three wise men. It just says they gave three gifts. There might have been five or six or seven or eight of them. Yeah. And he was totally surprised. There he was, older than I am now, just yeah. now learning that. Well, what I'm saying is, sometimes, you know, angels are singing redemption, sweet song. 
Yeah. How do they know anything about redemption? They don't. They don't understand anything about redemption. So why we sing those songs? <laughs> because uh, of the very reason that people say they're three wise people. <laughs> The point I'm making is that just the some things we take for granted, uh, and, and and they're just not. You just try to find them, and uh, does, it doesn't have any direct bearing on our study of Ecclesiastes. And I believe that people we all will be wrong about some things, but what we're wrong about can't be obligatory matters. And by that I mean what one must do to be saved, and what one must do to be faithful. Did Paul believe the earth was flat around? <laughs> well, the point I'm asking is there are questions we ask. What are angels doing right now? Tell me. Well, you said, I think they're singing. Just see if you can. When I get up there, I'll let you know. <laughs> there's a Bible. There's a, there's, a, there's a Bible here that's going to let us know all we need to know and must know about everything. I'm just trying to say. And I don't even know heaven's up there. Well, it says in the Revelation. What? That, that the angels are school. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Because the angels sing. Well, if we're going to be in heaven, we've got to be something. <laughs> That's my point. My point. We can't. My point is this: we can't grasp all these things. God has stuff in store for us that we can't grasp. That's the thing that comes out of some of this stuff that He's saying about trying to figure out why God put me here in the first place. Why did He choose this route? And he does this kind of thing in chapter three. Um, what, is, what then is the best life for a man to live here under the sun? What does he do with his life? Because to everything there's a season, a time to every purpose under heaven. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up that which is planted, and so on. I'm going to read all of it because it's kind of lengthy. Um, notice verse 11. He had made everything beautiful in his time also, he has set the world in their heart. Now, that's eternity. This, uh, if you look, I don't know whether you have an American standard. Or, American James, it says eternity. eternity. This, this is the point that I wanted to make right here. Uh, how is it that a person, if we're nothing but evolved over multiplied millions and millions and millions of years of chance evolution, and there is no God, why does man even ever entertain the possibility of a God? Why would he even entertain anything that's beyond material? Why? Why, why, do, why do men do these things in a way? What, what's there to make it? Well, there's nothing there to make it go. But God has said eternity. That is, the spirit made the image of God, bearing the moral likeness of God, also has set in his heart his spirit, his inward man. He has uh, that, that yearning, that reality of that you're not going to cease to be when you die. As somebody said one time, uh, there weren't any atheist in the foxholes when they were fine. <laughs> this kind of thing. So uh, what's being said in this chapter, he is he is emphasizing how far he's gone in his search for the purpose of life under the sun. Now in this chapter he's sharing then observations. And that's why he gives us all of these different times. Time to be born, time to die, time to do this, time to marry, uh, and all this kind of thing. There's a season for it. A time for every purpose under heaven. So God has given man the task to seek out God's purpose. 
And what did he give him? He said eternity in man's heart. But then he also saw that no one able to find out what God does from the beginning to the end. And no one can change what he decides to do. So why does God act this way? Uh, why are his purposes, as I said earlier, often incomprehensible to us? So the preacher offers that God does this so man might fear him. Now he's laying groundwork, what he's going to say over here in chapter 12 later on. Because God's going to require an account from every one of us for what we did on this earth. And he states again here, this, this seemingly prompts him to do so, uh, what he did in verses 24 through 26 of chapter 2. And there he said, there's nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink and that he should make it so enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw that it was from the hand of God. For who can eat, or who else can hasten here unto more than I? So he ends up saying almost the same thing. Notice that we'll start reading verse 11 again. He has made everything new. Time also he has set eternity in their heart so that no man can find out the work that God makes us from the beginning to the end. I know that there is no good in them, but for a man to rejoice and to do good in his life, and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor, it is the gift of God. That's as far as he's able to go, and it's, it's to where he is right now. Uh, this is the gift of God, if you want to call it that, and it's just simply to enjoy what you can enjoy while you're here to the best of your ability. But now we know from the rest of the Old Testament, and of course, especially the New Testament, there's far more to life than those things. So next he describes what he saw under, again, under the sun. In places where there should be judgment and righteousness, what does he see? He sees wickedness and iniquity. Now let me ask you. When you look in this nation and the time you've been here in the last five years, nothing else. When you look to where there ought to be equity and justice, what do you see? No. You saw just what he saw. You saw wickedness and iniquity. Now the question he raises is, well, why does God allow that? Well, that's been the perpetual thing for a long time. That's the reason I go back to what I said a while ago. Why did God choose this way? That's like saying when man sinned in the garden, why didn't the Savior immediately come? How come he put the devil in their end? Well, we don't know that he put the devil in there. Well, he was there. <laughs> <laughs> so where did he come from? Well, God made everything. <laughs> well, God yeah. created the devil, but not as the devil. Yeah, yeah he was an angel and fell. It's obvious that whatever power the yeah. devil has, God allows it. Read Job. Yeah. You're going to find Job parallels a lot of this. Yeah. If you'll read Job along with it. Uh, you remember in dealing with Job that at the beginning of the book, the sons of God are gathered with God, and here comes the devil along in the middle of them. Well, that sounds strange to us, doesn't it? But God then calls the devil's attention to Job. Yeah. Have you considered my servant Job? Well, that tells me the devil's in the considering business. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that tells me also why it says he's like a roaring lion yeah. going about seeking from the native doctor of the power. So he says, Well, have you missed him? Look at him. God drew the attention of the devil to Job. But uh, first notice, he says, You can take away all you've got. Can't take me. So, whatever power the devil has, don't be allowed to God. Then the next time around, the same thing happens again. And then he tells him, you can touch him, but you can't kill him. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. And you even find in the book of Revelation that it says the devil is bound. 
Well, binding means he's limited. So in what way is the devil limited now in the Christian dispensation? He can't force you against your will to run after him. And we're even warned in the scriptures that we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. We are told that with every uh, temptation, he'll make a way of escape. And we're told to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against all the wiles of the devil. So we have that wherewithal. So there's a purpose to the devil. But God, even though he created all things creatable, he didn't create the devil for devil. He became the devil. Now, I raise this question. How is that possible? Let me ask you, if angels in heaven, see what we come up with from you this time. <laughs> If the angels in heaven at one time sinned and God cast them down into the chain of darkness to reserve in darkness for, for judgment. And the devil was not created a devil, a liar, and a murderer. But they all did this in heaven before they ever won a world. Tell me why we get to heaven. Tell me why when we get to heaven that we can't fall from heaven. The devil did. And the angels didn't fall from heaven. Tell me why. I couldn't understand what you said the last few things you talked What I said was if yeah. the devil sinned in heaven and the angels sinned in heaven and the Bible says they did, and that's yeah. God's words, so God said they did. Tell me why that once we get to heaven, we can't fall in the same way. Uh, how to wait until I get there? <laughs> you get there, you may be kicked out. Right? I might not even get there. Well, here's the point. Here's the point. We have told us over and over again, in one way or the other, or extent of another, the New Testament, that God's not going to allow it to be that way. God's not going to permit it. This, this, is, this even raises more questions. So, therefore, in this whole great creation, of what's going to be after material, physical things and time and space is long gone. Is involving how we live here as to how we will be there. But he vouchsafes for us. You read how many places in the scriptures tell us once you get there, that's where you're going to be. What he turned it at? Whether the angels were singing or not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't find that because I know I read it. Well, the point is, this writer way back there yeah. is proving himself a thinker, even though we need some help, is that what is my purpose here under the sun? I'm telling you, if you go out here, try out this and ask them, what is your purpose for being here? You go out and ask somebody more to yard or digging a ditch or whatever, you probably say, well, like, my job, I got to do it to make a paycheck. But you know, that's about as far as most people go. They don't think you ought to. And this book is designed to say you ought to. And you don't necessarily think like he thinks. 